We're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 24 this morning. So if you have a Bible, get over to Luke chapter 24. And let me mention, if you, if you don't have a Bible, along the aisles here this morning, we've got some Bibles. If you're sitting along the aisle, uh, grab those and just hand them down. If you need a Bible this morning, you can use that one and you can take it with you. That's our gift to you this morning if you need to have a Bible to follow along with us. We're uh, going to finish our series this morning called Behold the Man. We've been looking at the final week of the life of Jesus, and this morning uh, we look at Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I was thinking this week about the, the resurrection and the concept of hope, and one thing that came to my mind is how when we are young, we really begin our lives with a great deal of hope, at least most of us. Uh, everybody, I'm going to guess, in this room when you were a child at some point, or if you're still a child, you've been asked, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? What is your imagined future uh, when you grow up? What, what are your dreams? What are your hopes? Uh, I, I thought I would share just a few examples this morning of some kids who had some great answers to that question, right? So an answer to what do you want to be when you grow up or what do you hope for your future? Uh, this kid said, what are three things you want to do in the future? He's got three goals. You can see him. One is get a girlfriend. Two, kiss her. Three, rule the world, right? So, you know, numbers one and two are, are reasonable. They're not out of the realm of possibility. Number three is very lofty. Uh, another favorite of mine, this kid has asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I don't know how well you can see that from where you're sitting. He says, when I was three, I wanted to be a dad. When I was four, I wanted to be a toy designer. When I was five, I wanted to be a video game maker. Now that I am 5.5, I know I want to be a ninja chef. Okay, now my favorite part of this is his, his work schedule that he's proposed here. Monday to Thursday, chef. Friday, ninja. Saturday and Sunday, off. Oh, man. That's a fantastic schedule. I love that. What a, what a great dream for his life. Now, some of these kids had more modest goals. This one kid, when I, when I grow up, he says, I am seven, I want to be eight. Hey, so his dreams are very realistic, very pragmatic. Now, I don't know what yours were when you were growing up, but I'm sure you were asked that question. Uh, when kids are asked that question, there are, there are people who do uh, surveys and studies, like what are the most common answers? And of course, when they're young, you, you get a lot of very lofty dreams. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a rock star. I want to be the president of the United States. I want to rule the world. Now, what's interesting, though, is as we get older, those hopes and dreams tend to get much more modest, right? And they, they tend to be dampened by life a little bit. So uh, there are people who also ask grown-ups, what do you want to be in the future, right? What do you hope to be one day down the road? And uh, I read one study this week that said the most common answer, when they ask grown-ups, what do you want to be when you get older? The most common answer is retired, right? So, so, our, so our hopes and our dreams, they, they, tend to, they tend to shrink a little bit. We go from saying, I want to rule the world. I want to be an astronaut to saying, you know what? My dream is I just want to get to where I don't got to do nothing. I want to be retired. And, and I thought, why is that? Why does that happen? And I think it's often because uh, the course of life as a way of dampening our hopes. Or you might say we tend to leak hope, right? We, we start out when we're young and we're just, we're full of hope. We look at the future with an outrageous sense of hope and optimism. And as time goes on, it kind of leaks away very slowly because the demands and the disappointments and the trials of our lives tend to shrink our hopes. And also because Almost everything that we place our hope in eventually disappoints us. And so we start by saying, I'm going to have a fantastic career at the top of the pile. And when it doesn't happen, we feel disappointed. Or maybe it does, and it's not as great as we thought. I'm going to have the perfect family, the perfect marriage, the perfect kids. I'm going to coast through life in an unbroken line of success. And life has a way of dampening that hope. 
I wanna ask you this question this morning. I don't know where you are or how you're feeling as you walk in the room, but let me ask you this question. When was the last time? I want you to try to remember the last time in your life that you looked at the future with an outrageous sense of hope. When was the last time that you looked ahead and you said, I believe with a firm conviction in my soul that tomorrow will be better than today? I believe with a firm conviction in my soul that I've got a hope for the future that cannot be shaken. When was the last time you looked at your future with an outrageous sense of hope? What what I want us to do this morning in the face of the reality that we have leaked some of our hope, I want to refill us. I want to refill us with hope. We just sang about the hope of the good news of Jesus Christ. And where I want to take us this morning is is simply to say that if you are struggling with hope this morning, and by the way, there's no shame in that. Every single person struggles with hope for the future. And if you're struggling with hope this morning, here's where I want us to land. That because this morning we celebrate a risen Savior, we have an everlasting hope for a life in the future that is unshakably perfect through Jesus Christ. We're going to look at a passage this morning from the book of Luke. It's right at the end of the gospel of Luke. And we're going to see the story of a couple of disciples, a couple of followers of Jesus who, like us, they had leaked hope. They had placed their hope in certain expectations for their lives and for their world. Much like us, they had expectations for their country, for themselves, for their lives. And they had experienced, much like us, a string of disappointments. And we're going to see how Jesus restores their hope. And and I hope we will see him restore hope our hopes this morning. So that's what we're going to see in Luke chapter 24. Grab your Bible and follow along with me for a couple of minutes. I'm going to start in verse 13. And let me, let me say, this is after the resurrection of Jesus. Peter and and Mary Magdalene and Mary and Joanna have already discovered the empty tomb. And then in verse 13, we read this, and behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people. And now the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him saying, stay with us for it is getting toward evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. 
They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. I love this passage because I love how Jesus interrupts their lives as they're talking about Jesus, right? And and as they're talking about Jesus, he comes alongside him and goes, hey, what you talking about? And they say, are are you really the only one who doesn't know, right? This would be like in 2016, if you run across two people talking about the presidential election and you hear them talking about it, you go, hey, what what are you talking about? They go, the election. They go, "What, what, what election? And they'd go, are you the only person in the entire universe who doesn't know what we're talking about. And Jesus goes, well, why don't, why don't you tell me? And they say this, they say, hey, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus was a man who was this mighty prophet. He said great things. He did great things. And then he died. And I want to zero in for a few minutes on one statement that these men make in the, in the context of talking to Jesus. And it's this statement, but we were hoping that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. In fact, when Jesus first comes up, he says, what are you talking about? He says, they, they stand still and they're, they're looking sad. And what I want us to see this morning is, is, again, they're looking sad because they were hoping in Jesus and their hopes have been crushed because he died. They said, but we were hoping he was the one. And I want to offer three ways in which these men resemble us as we look at this passage this morning. The first one is this, like them, we need hope. We need hope. Okay, and I'm not saying that as some sort of metaphor or some sort of of statement that, yeah, hope is nice. What I mean is this, without hope, we die. I believe that hope is is as central to our ability to live as food or air or water. How do I define hope? Hope is simply this. Hope is the belief that the future will be good even if the present is painful. Hope is the belief that the future will be good even if the present is painful. It's what allows us to look into the future and say, hey, maybe next year will be better than this year, right? Uh, New Year's is always a time of great hope. You say, this is the year that I am finally going to get my finances under control. This is the year that I am finally going to be healthy. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to exercise. This is the year that I am finally going to bring up my GPA. That's hope. Right, I was a mechanical engineering major at A&M, and I, I was uh, not a bad student, but I wasn't a great student. I didn't have a 4.0. I kind of hovered there in the, in the three range. Sometimes a semester might drop down where my grades began with twos. Other semesters, it might go up three five, three six. But there was always a moment at the beginning of the semester before I had gone to any classes or taken any tests where I could pause and I could say, right now, I have a 4-0. And maybe this is the semester that I'll keep it. Right, that's hope. Now, my hopes were always dashed on the hard rocks of the reality of my classes. But I would renew that hope every semester. Hope is the belief that when I look into the future, the future will be good, even if the present is painful. We're wired for hope. And like I said, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say without hope, we will die. There's a psychological tool. It's called the Beck Hopelessness Scale. And all it is, it's a series of questions that, that, that it asks about how somebody feels about the future. Do you believe there's a possibility that the future will be better than today? Do you believe that things can improve, right? And a series of questions. Here's what they found. Those who score very high on hopelessness are 11 times more likely to commit suicide than those who have hope. It accurately predicts suicide risk because without hope, we die. And so we're wired for hope. As we move throughout the scripture, we see the word hope come up over and over 
and over again. We see the concept that we're wired for the future. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Solomon said he set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. In our hearts, there is this hope that, that the future will be better than today. He said eternity in your heart. You want to have a life forever. That's a hope that's written into your mind, heart, and body. That's why the, the writer of Proverbs, also Solomon, would say this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life, hope deferred. When I hope for something, I hope for that raise, I hope for that promotion, I hope for that future, I hope that my family will be better tomorrow than today. When that doesn't happen, it says hope deferred, it makes your heart sick. But what does desire fulfilled do? It's a tree of life. Hope resurrects us and brings us back to life. We need hope like we need air and water and food. So here are these men, they're, they're on the road to Emmaus, and they say, we were hoping, we were hoping he was the one. And they're expressing this hope that runs throughout the scripture. In the New Testament, the word for hope is used 84 times, the verb and the noun, 84 times. In the Old Testament, there are probably 75 to 80 references to hope using different Hebrew words. When Israel was in exile in Jeremiah 29, 11, God says to them what? He promises them what? A hope and a future. And these men say, we were hoping, we were hoping that he was the one. And they're sad. Why? Because they need hope. But like us, they've lost hope in the face of death. We need hope, but here's the problem. We, we all lose hope. As I said earlier, we all leak hope. We all lose hope because the course of our lives provides all of these opportunities for us to be disappointed. Happened to these men. I want you to get a sense of what they're experiencing, okay? Jesus, you may not know this, Jesus was not the first one to come along and claim to be the Messiah. Now, what was the Messiah? The Messiah was simply a, a king that God had promised to the people of Israel. As you read through the Old Testament prophets, there are these promises that a king is coming and that king will redeem or save the nation from all of their enemies, that that king will give them the opportunity forever to live on the promised land in peace and security with enough food to eat and all that they would need. Jesus isn't the first one to come along and say he's the Messiah. In fact, as you read the book of Acts, there's this moment in the book of Acts where the Jewish council, it's called the Sanhedrin, sort of like their senate, right? They're debating, what do we do with this Jesus guy? And some people are saying, I think we should kill him. And other people aren't so sure. And there's this guy named Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a teacher of the law, a really respected rabbi. Gamaliel gets up and he says this. He goes, look, I want you to remember something. Some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody. And a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. What's he saying? There were these other guys. Hey, you remember, there were other guys that said they were the king, that said they were the Messiah. You know what happened to them? They died. So he goes, look, if this Jesus guy is from God, you're not going to be able to stop him anyway. If he's not, hey, he's going to die. No worries. All right, so you have these two men walking down the road to Emmaus, and I want you to imagine they have experienced a succession of false messiahs. And here comes Jesus. And Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. And the Son of Man is a title that goes back to the book of Daniel. And this is important in the book of Daniel. Daniel says this, he has this vision. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days 
and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and what? And a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So here comes Jesus, and he says, I'm that guy. I'm the son of man. And these two guys on the road to Emmaus, they go, okay, we've experienced disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. Our hope is leaking, but here's Jesus, and he does miracles, and he raises Lazarus from the dead, and he teaches like no Nobody has ever taught before. And they hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. Israel that had been under oppression for thousands of years from a series of foreign nations. The Romans, they were under oppression at this moment from the Romans. The Romans could do anything to them, right? The Romans could kill them without a reason. You could be walking down the road. The Romans could take your clothes and say, hey, we need it for a soldier. They taxed them to the point of poverty. You think your taxes this year were bad? Try being a Jew in the Roman Empire. By the time the taxes were done, you had very little left. And so these these guys are saying, Jesus could be the one to make our lives better, to set us free from all of that. We were hoping he was the one, but he's dead. And so their hope is leaked away. Again, I think this is something that happens to many of us, if not all of us, eventually. We have a vision of our future, right? We have a dream of what it's going to be like, and it doesn't turn out that way, right? So we follow one Messiah after another. Maybe it is a career. Maybe it is a a relationship with either a significant other or a spouse, right? Maybe it is your health or whatever it is. You go, you know what? That Messiah failed me. My career didn't work out like I'd hoped, but at least I got my family. Oh, wait, my family has problems, but at least I got my health. Oh, wait, now my health is failing. And we leak hope. Think back to the first time that you had some dream that got squished. All right, I'm, I'm going to share, this is just, this is very uh, tender and sensitive for me, but I'm going to share a little bit about a dream of mine, okay? When I was uh, in my teens and early 20s, I dreamed of being a professional musician. Right, that's what I wanted to be. I, I wanted to be somebody that people knew as a musician. I wanted to make my living that way, singing and writing songs, right? So, so uh, one summer, it just so happened that I found myself in a conversation with a few young guys like myself, and, and we were talking to an older guy who, uh, you know, it wasn't Bono, but it was a guy who had made his living as a musician. He, he was relatively well-known in certain circles, and so we're asking him questions. How do we get started in this business? What can we do? And I'll never forget, this guy was in his late 40s at the time, and uh, he said, hey, if your age begins with a two, it's too late. I was 21. And I remember thinking, oh man, why didn't you tell me this two years ago? Now, in hindsight, I realized his own career was on a downward trajectory, and he was feeling a little angry and bitter. And it, you know, it turned out it actually wasn't my age that disqualified me. It was, it was other things like not enough talent, right? So, uh, <laughs> but I wonder if you've ever had a moment like that where you came face to face with the reality that the future I envisioned is not necessarily the future that's going to happen, right? Maybe, maybe it is in your role as, as a spouse or in your role as a parent or in your job. Whatever it is, you, 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 you look at your life and you go, man, this isn't what I envisioned. And, and like these two men on the road to Emmaus, you have, you have leaked hope. A few years ago, the Harvard Business Review did this article. It was called, Why So Many of Us Experience a Midlife Crisis. And, and whether you're in midlife or not, I think this applies this morning. Here's what they said. It said, here's why. It says, young people, it turns out, are overly optimistic, expecting significant increases in life satisfaction over time. Young adults typically believe they'll beat the average. They'll be the lucky ones who end up with a top job, a happy marriage, and healthy children. As we age, things often don't turn out as nicely as we planned. The beautiful understatement. 
We may not climb up the career ladder as quickly as we wished, or we do only to find that prestige and a high income are not as satisfying as we expected them to be. Midlife becomes a time of double misery made up of disappointments and evaporating aspirations. Paradoxically, listen to this, those who objectively have the least reason to complain, for example, they have a desirable job, often suffer the most. They feel ungrateful and disappointed with themselves, particularly because their discontent seems so unjustified, which creates a vicious circle. They're talking about leaking hope. These men have had their hope leak away. It may be that you're, you're in the room this morning and that's where you are. I don't know. It may be you're in the room and you still look ahead and you say, I have a wild and outrageous hope for the future. But that may not be true. Right? It may be that, that your future hasn't looked like you thought it would. So, so here's, here's where I want to go then for the next few minutes. I want us to see how Jesus looks at these two men now and he's going to restore their hope. He's going to say, look, I know, I know your hope has leaked. I know your hope has faded. I know you're hurting. I get it. I know. And that's why Jesus came to restore hope. And so what they find is that in the face of this loss of hope, what does Jesus do now? He's going to restore the hope that they thought that they had lost for good. Right? Again, what I love about this passage is that at first Jesus doesn't Reveal to them who he is. They don't recognize him. Somehow Jesus keeps himself incognito. It's like the ultimate episode of Undercover Boss, Jesus style. Right? He shows up and he goes, hey, what are you, what are you guys talking about? And they tell him, hey, hey, look, man, everybody's talking about it. And he goes, what? And then they describe all that Jesus has done and all that Jesus is. And as I read the passage this week, I couldn't help but wonder, why does Jesus do this? Why does he hide who he is at first? Is he just, is he having fun? Is this a fun practical joke for Jesus? I don't think so. I think here's what's going on. Jesus wants them to express, here's where our hope was. And then express that disappointment. So that he, in the face of that loss of hope, can say, oh man, there's some good news you don't know. There's some good news you don't know because now what Jesus is going to do is he says to them, look, didn't you know this had to happen? You need to understand. It says he, he opens up the Bible and it says beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explains to them all the things written about himself. Man, that is a conversation I wish I had been there for. And he says, here's what had to happen. You need to understand your loss of hope. You know why you've lost hope? You've lost hope because of death. Death is the problem that sprang out of sin. See, here's what happened is all of the world rebelled against God. It started with Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the first people in the world, they said, God, we don't want to go your way. And as a result, they, they underwent a curse that we are all under, the curse of death, not just physical death, but spiritual death, spiritual separation from God. So we all stand under a curse and so throughout the prophets, we begin to see these prophecies that one day someone's going to come, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to take that curse for you and die. That's what the passage, Isaiah 53, that we, we talked about it last week. We talked about it on Good Friday. It says that this one who's coming, Isaiah said that someone's coming, and you know what's going to happen? He will be pierced for our transgressions. He will be crushed. Why? For our sins and iniquities, the fact that we have wandered away from God. It says, all of us like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord placed on him the punishment for us all. So Jesus said, I, I had to die, because the only way to restore hope, the only way to beat death was to go right through it, to take it and beat it. And so here he stands. And he explains to them, no, hope isn't lost. Hope has been reborn. And so he goes and he sits down with them and he begins to break bread. And then all of a sudden they recognize who it is. And I love that. As soon as they recognize him, Jesus goes, poof, right? And he disappears. And they look at each other. And, and I love this, this phrase that they say next. They say, 
were not our hearts burning within us as he explained the scriptures? You know what I think they're saying? As Jesus spoke from the word of God, we felt hope rekindle. As Jesus explained who he was and what he'd done, we, we felt that fire of hope that had, had leaked away. We're in our hearts burning. And they go and, and they tell the disciples, now nah, it's real. What they actually say is something that we say every Easter. Dusty said it earlier. When we say he is risen, how do we respond? He is risen indeed. They say he's risen indeed. We've seen him. And Simon Peter has seen him. And hope is restored. So that as we move throughout the rest of the New Testament, the concept of hope, man, it comes back over and over and over again. Look at 1 Thessalonians verse 4. Paul wrote, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have what? No hope. For if we believe that Jesus did what? He died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we shall always be with the Lord therefore comfort one another with these words that's the message of hope and what do we say he is risen he is risen indeed I want you to see also Peter who saw Jesus alive Peter says this blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to what a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. He is risen. He is risen indeed. The writers of the New Testament say this is where hope comes from. That Jesus Christ defeated death, Jesus Christ defeated sin that separated us from God. And on that Sunday morning when the tomb was empty, we know that he rose again. So that no matter what disappoints you in this life, no matter what series of false messiahs we find ourselves chasing that let us down, Jesus is alive. And so we have an unshakable hope for the future, but we also have meaning for today because we've been restored to a relationship with God. And so we have the privilege of sharing the message that Jesus is alive and he wants to reconnect people to the life that God gave us when the world began. Except this time it won't end. That's the restoration of hope. All right, so, so, so as we close, in a couple of minutes we're, we're gonna close in worship, but I wanna ask a, a couple of questions of you this morning. First one is this, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe that on that day the tomb was empty? Right, because if you want to have hope for the future, if you want to have that outrageous sense of hope, you need to know. Hope comes from the reality that every disappointment, every sin, every death has been overturned by Jesus. And all who trust in Jesus will one day, the scripture tells us, like we just read, rise again to a beautiful future that can never be taken away and will never disappoint. See, they, they said they're hoping that he'd be the one to redeem Israel. And you know what? They were right. It's just that he's coming back again to do it. Do you believe it? I don't know where you are spiritually this morning, but it may be you're in the room and you're not really sure if Jesus really rose from the dead. Here's my challenge to you, is go, go do the work, go do the research. And here, here's what I'm going to say. I am utterly convinced that there is no historical event with such, with such great foundation in reality 
than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think about this all the time in the face of struggle and and doubt that I feel. Is it true? I I can tell you this morning, I, I, I firmly believe, as sure as I am of anything, that the tomb was empty. Right, and one, one of the strongest reasons is this. It's, just, it's the testimony of the Scripture. And here's what I mean. I just find no way that so many people over such a long period of time would insist so strongly that that tomb was empty and that they saw the risen Savior if it wasn't true. Right, one or two people, yeah, they might lie. They might be crazy. But, but Paul, when he writes 1 Corinthians, he says, I just want you to know that, that 500 people who are still alive, 500 people saw it. Right, this is decades after Jesus rose from the dead. Some of you know the name Charles Colson. Charles Colson, uh, later in his life, was a, a Bible teacher, but earlier in his life, he went to jail for his participation in the Watergate scandal involving Richard Nixon back in the 1970s. Became a Christian in prison. And he says this, he says that Watergate actually proved the resurrection for him. And here's why. He says, here were the 10 most powerful men in the United States. With all that power, we couldn't contain a lie for two weeks. Take it from one who was involved in a conspiracy, who saw the frailty of man firsthand. There is no way the 11 apostles who were with Jesus at the time of the resurrection could ever have gone around for 40 years proclaiming Jesus' resurrection, unless it were true. And I I have to agree. So do you believe that the tomb is empty? And if it's empty, will you you put your trust in Jesus and you say, Jesus, I I believe that because of that, my sin is forgiven and I, I accept the eternal life you offer. If you don't yet believe that this morning, or if you're, you're sitting in your chair and you say, I want that hope, I want to know him, come and talk with me. Come and talk with any, any of our men and women who have these name tags this morning, they can help you. Do you believe? And then secondly, where's your hope? Right? Because I, I think there are some of us that we're in the room and we, we believe, we say, I believe it's true, but on a day-to-day basis, we find ourselves putting hope in these false messiahs. Right, and so, so bitterness and, and disappointment, uh, it, it begins to creep into our hearts. Right? I, was, I was talking to a, a friend a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, I understand now. I never understood when I was young. I understand now why there are a lot of angry old men. Here's why. Because you put your hope in things that disappoint. And the more they disappoint, the more you try to press into them to make them fit your expectations. And they disappoint you in even deeper ways. And what grows in your heart is bitterness. And I think if Jesus were walking in the room with us this morning, like he was walking with those men, he would say this, you need to retrain your hope and put it in me. This isn't a one-time thing, by the way. I mean, when you trusted in Jesus Christ, your eternal future was secure. But day by day, through the power of the Spirit, man, every morning I got to wake up and I got to retrain my hope. I wake up in the morning and I say, God, I'm tempted to place my hope in stuff that's going to let me down, whether it's a bank account, whether it's my wife and kids, whether it's my job, whether it's a friend, whatever it is. I don't want to grow old and bitter. But I want to fix my eyes on that empty tomb. I say, God, the day is coming. The day is coming when the clouds will part and the trumpet will sound and I believe that I will be with you again. And until that day, I live in hope. And until that day, I live to proclaim the message. You want to feel that sense of outrageous joy and hope for your future. Transfer that hope to Jesus. That's the good news. Would you pray with me and then we'll close in worship. Oh, Father, we're grateful this morning for the opportunity to worship you and to hear from your word. And Father, we believe the tomb is empty. That on that resurrection morning, on the first day of the week, when those disciples arrived, not only was there nobody there in the tomb, but that Jesus Christ was alive 
and he's still alive and in heaven. Father, we thank you that he sent the Holy Spirit, and so we pray that the Spirit would move right now. If there's a single person in this room this morning wrestling with whether or not it's all real, I pray your Spirit would speak to tell them it is. And Father, for those of us who walk, we walk by faith and not by sight. We're like those two disciples. We, we walk along the road and we go, man, I have hopes. But we haven't, we haven't seen him in the flesh. But we know one day we will. And like those men, we are foolish of heart and we are slow to believe. So reinvigorate our hope. Father, let us each day transfer our hope to the reality of Jesus Christ. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.